Hello, my name is Bill Hudson. I'm Building Inspection Supervisor for the Village of Oak Brook, Illinois. I'm also a subject matter expert and instructor for ICC. I'm a Master Code Professional and a BPI Certified Building Analyst. Today we're going to be discussing and presenting a webinar for the 2012 IECC update. The format will include a question and answer at the end. Please feel free to jot down questions and comments to call in. This seminar introduces participants to the major changes from the 2009 IECC to the 2012. Please remember that this webinar is intended to give highlights only. There will be changes and interpretations that are not included in this webinar. For a complete exploration of these changes, please take either a 2012 updates or a 2012 IECC fundamentals course. Contact for information will be provided at the end of the webinar. The 2012 IECC has been designed to provide a 30% energy improvement over the benchmark, which was the 2006. On this table, you see a comparison between LEED, ASHRAE, and IECC, along with the International Green Construction Code. The benchmark is the 2006 IECC, or ASHRAE 90.1-2004. The significant improvements that have been provided for in this code are shown, and they're shown incrementally for the years and the additions that have been published. There are some new marginal markings within the IECC. There are solid vertical lines that you're all familiar with. They indicate a technical change. There are arrows that indicate where something's been deleted. But there are now single and double asterisks. They indicate where a table has been relocated or that a section has been relocated. There are also now letter designations in front of the IECC code sections. This tells the code development committee that will be maintaining the code. The CEs are Commercial Energy Code Development Committee, M is Mechanical, and the RE is the Energy Code Development Committee, which is dealing with residential. Now, the 2012 is arranged much differently than the 2009 was. It contains two complete separate sets of provisions. The distinction between residential and commercial is still the same as it was in the previous codes. Residential provisions apply to detached one and two family dwellings and multiple single family dwellings, which are townhomes, as well as group R2, R3, R4 buildings, three stories or less in height. Commercial provisions, basically anything that doesn't qualify or doesn't fit into the definition of a residential building. Now, as you're doing energy code, please remember these two definitions. Please remember the differentiation. It is not the same as the traditional IBC, IRC split. The table of contents represent that the codes are now split into two sections. There's still one volume, however, there is a full section for commercial provisions and a full section for residential provisions. Each one has its own scope and administration, definitions, general requirement, and specific technical energy requirements along with reference standards and an index. Each section of the book is set so that it will be able to stand independently and a user will be able to stay completely within that section for the buildings that he or she happens to be reviewing. Chapter 2 definitions. The definitions are slightly different for commercial and residential buildings. The webinar will highlight whether the definition is a commercial or a residential change or whether it is for both. New for commercial buildings is the concept of building commissioning. Now those of you that are familiar with the ASHRAE process are familiar with buildings being commissioned. This has been now brought into the process of the IECC. This verifies and documents that the selected buildings have been designed, installed, and function according to what the requirements are. Basically this is proving up 
what the design is, and that it's in fact working. There's a new definition for both commercial and residential, the definition of a continuous air barrier. It's a combination of materials and assemblies that restrict or prevent passage of air through the building thermal envelope. That's a very broad and general definition. That is not specifically calling for one product or one type of product to be an air barrier. It's not specifically calling out house wrap. It's not specifically calling out any spray applied product, but it is defining what a continuous air barrier is. New for commercial is the concept of dynamic glazing. Fenestration that can change its performance factors, including its U factor, solar gain, heat gain coefficient, or visual transmittance. These are windows that will change on command from transparent to even up to opaque. Dynamic glazing is one of the new technologies that is being recognized in the code. There's a new definition in the commercial section for field fabricated fenestration product. This is something where the parts show up on site and the tradespeople build it on site. Now this is different than the next definition that we'll see which is site built fenestration. New for commercial and residential is the concept of site built fenestration. It was discussed in the 2009 codes, but now we have a definition. Site built fenestration is a window or door product that is built using factory cut, factory fabricated parts that are assembled on site. Please remember the difference between field fabricated and site built. It makes a large difference in the way that the code is interpreted and enforced. Another new definition is on-site renewable energy. Now if you look at the definition, it includes solar, wind, wave, tide, landfill gas, biomass, internal heat of the earth. It does not include firewood. And whatever you use, on-site renewable energy has to come from the project site. A new definition for both commercial and residential is visible transmittance. This is the ratio of visible light that's coming through glazing. It's expressed in a number between 0 and 1. This will be important. There's a residential definition for whole house mechanical ventilation system. We've seen these. Now there's actually some language in the code that recognizes and tells us how to utilize it. Chapter 2 also includes some revised definitions. Building includes mechanical, service water heating, and electric power lighting systems located on the building site and supporting the building. We have an exterior furnace here. That would now be included as part of the building, although it may be classified under zoning as an accessory structure. Under the Energy Code, this would be part of the building. Another definition that was rewritten to clarify, residential building has been revised to make sure that townhomes, townhouses have been included in the definition of residential building. Section C402 addresses the building envelope requirements. These have been significantly beefed up over the 2009 IECC. Roof solar reflectance and thermal emittance is now included. Insulation performance is improved. Fenestration performance actually allows more flexibility and the air leakage requirements have been expanded. Also in section 402, there's a minimum skylight fenestration area, which is a significant change from the earlier codes. Earlier code said you could, you know, the 2009 said you could only have 3% skylight. Now if you have more than 10,000 square feet and a ceiling height greater than 15 feet, you have to have daylight zones provided by skylights. 
New to this code also are solar heat gain coefficient adjustment multipliers. Table 402.3.3.1 gives specific multipliers for buildings that have a projection factor greater than 0.2. So if you don't have a 0.2 projection factor on a window, you may not use these adjustments. However, if you have a projection factor of greater than 0.2, you get to use this table and reduce the solar heat gain coefficient factors on your windows. For example, if you're in climate zones 1 to 3, you're required to have a solar heat gain coefficient of 0.25. Now if you had a projection factor someplace between 0.2 and 0.5, that would go from 0.25 to 0.275. Those of us that are in uh, climate zones 4 through 6 are required to have a solar heat gain coefficient of 0.4, that would go to 0.44. We're referencing table 402.3.3 for the solar heat gain coefficients. Now, if you have a north orientation, you're allowed to increase by a certain projection by a certain factor, and all other orientations are allowed another factor. Now it has to be oriented within 45 degrees of true north. However, if you've got a projection factor greater than 0.5, if you're required to have a 0.25 in your climate zone, you can go to 0.3. If you're required to have a 0.4 climate zone, you can go to 0.48. So these are significant reductions in window performance just by, perform, by the allowance of a projection factor and the orientation of the building, which should provide some more design flexibility and economy for the design professional. Section 402.4.1.2 gives air barrier compliance options. Now there are three options. You can choose from any one of them you can use all of them if you want to, including materials, assemblies, and building test. The materials option provides a list of materials that are deemed to comply if they're installed properly, including plywood, cement board, gypsum board, different thicknesses of open cell and closed cell foam, polystyrene, and foil back polyisocyanurate. Also materials that are deemed to comply are build-up roofing, fully adhered single ply, 5 8 inch Portland sand parge, cast in place concrete, sheet metal aluminum, fully grouted block masonry. All of those are deemed to comply if they're properly installed. There are certain assemblies that are presumed to comply. Sealed CMUs or 12 millimeter or half inch parge of stucco or plaster can be an assembly option to demonstrate compliance. There's also a building test option for commercial buildings at this point. Once again, you have three options. You can choose between those options and utilize the one or all that's appropriate for your project.